Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. May I have attention, please? All quiet, please. Thank you. Go ahead, take out your notes. We're going to be continuing on looking at the Renaissance. Um, and um, yes, I know it was interesting. Those of you who are at home, yes, everything that we're doing in here is exactly what's going on for you at home. No quizzes yet or any other assignments yet. They will be coming up. And of course, they will be posted on Google Classroom. Yes, and for you guys as well, those of you guys in here on Google Classroom, okay? So, you guys are doing okay on that? Keeping up all right? Okay, nothing too crazy. It's not like we're going through a pandemic. We are going through a pandemic, and we're learning about pandemics. But today, we're going to learn about some really cool things in history, including things that will touch on art. Any of you guys into art? Yeah, do you like art? Do you like Renaissance art? Do you, do you, do you know what I mean by Renaissance art? Okay, so you don't know if you like it or not. You're like, I don't know if I like it. I actually do have some examples of Renaissance art in here. Do you like Renaissance art? Yeah? What do you, which is one of your favorite Renaissance artists? Whoever did like the, uh, the, the dome? Do you know who that was that did the dome? You don't know? This is very interesting. Ferenza, Florence, we'll be talking about that. Beautiful church. They actually built the cathedral with a big hole in the middle. Well, I mean, it's kind of silly. They didn't have a dome yet. They're like, well, we'll figure that part out later. So they had this big, huge, massive building, right? And where the dome was supposed to go, they didn't have a dome built yet. Do you like the dome? Pretty nice dome. It was very difficult to do. And a guy by the name of Brunelleschi, very intelligent man, figured out how to build a dome that big that would support its own weight. Very, very clever. Very clever how he did that. But I want to say it was many decades after that church was originally built before he was able to actually do that. Okay. Anybody else like art, Renaissance art? Well, people are always of different opinions about Renaissance art because it's very different. And write this down. Renaissance art was a big deal in history, especially the history of art. Because a lot of big changes happened in artistic styles. Some of it was bringing back some of the old, old styles, but there was also some new things that were added to it. But I'm actually getting ahead of myself a little bit here because if you want to have, I mean, like, when they built that dome right over there, you see that? The dome? In Florence, that was expensive. That was really, really expensive. The church itself was really, really expensive, and the dome was incredibly expensive. And all of the art and so forth is expensive. So we get back to this question. You ready? Where did they get all that money? Where do they end up getting all of that money? Spencer, where are they getting all the money for art and architecture and some of the other things that we got going on? Taxes, okay, taxes, all right. So does the United States collect taxes? Yes. How do you get, wh which country ends up collecting more taxes? Countries that are wealthy or countries that are poor? Countries that are wealthy, right? I mean, so if we collected, you know, whatever percentage of tax from all the people in the United States of America, it's going to be a lot of money because we're a pretty wealthy country. If it's a much poorer country, you're not going to collect as much. So we get back to the original question. How did these areas in Italy get to be so wealthy so that some of that money could end up in construction and so forth? Trade. We got that across pretty well last time. Trade. So why was trade particularly uh, effective for Yale during this particular time period? Because of what? Perfect. Does that sound familiar? The Italian states were where a lot of the trade was entering into from the Mediterranean, trade coming even so far as away as like China and Japan and India. So why, Keith, was there so much more trade going on during this time period in the late, uh, mid-late 1300s and into the 1400s than before or even l after? So we, and then it all comes back around to the Mongols. A lot of different times as we go through 
this unit and the next one, we're reminded of the Mongols, right? So that's an interesting thing. When you can look at history and you can start to see things kind of connecting and how this influences that and this influences that and so forth, and then it comes together and it's like this crazy, amazing story of how we got to be where we are in the planet of the United States of America. I'm like, here's an easy one. Um, why, let's see if you know this one, why, Yakov, are we all wearing masks and shields <laughs> when we were attending school and we didn't last year? Because of the pandemic, where did that come from? From China, probably, in all likelihood. Well, how did it get over? I mean, that's a big ocean. How did it get over here? Over there, is there a lot of transportation going back and forth between the United States and China? We trade things with China. I mean, and travel. I mean, are there any parts of the world where uh, COVID hasn't hit yet? Alaska, it's hit Alaska. Antarctica, as I understand it, it has not hit Antarctica yet. Which we, <laughs> we should all move over there. And you go, let's go to Antarctica. Let's get some dogs and go, you know, get on some sleds and so forth. I mean, here's the thing. The world is very, very interconnected now. And that trade and transportation and so forth, it's very interconnected. We already saw that. So, like, for example, uh, Blake. What was one of the downsides of all the increased trade going on during the time of the Mongol trading empire? Disease. disease, yeah. Specifically, what disease was really, really dangerous back in those days? The Black Death. The Black Death, yeah, the plague. And it did. I mean, it hit people hard, right? Very, very hard. But we're, look, we're trying to look at sort of the positive side of this, all right? So we're looking at the money part. We've got the Italian states, a lot of trade coming in. Of the ones we covered so far, uh, Marin. Which of those three Italian uh, cities in particular is going to become wealthy, all of them are going to be wealthy, is going to become wealthy primarily through straight trade? Everyone should add this. I think we did this last time. Venice. How many of you guys agree Venice? How many of you guys would say, no, Rome. More trade went through Rome. How many of you guys say Florence? More trade went through Florence. Venice as it is. Yeah, we got a lot of trade going through Venice. Okay? And remind ourselves, when you have water connecting, Venice is a port city, you got a lot of vessels coming into Venice, and then you're like, and then you got canals and so forth. So there's a lot of trade in Venice, and they put it into buildings. Like for example, Addy, what would be a particular part of Venetian society that a lot of money was spent on? Okay, yes, the wealthy people spent money on their houses. But what also got a lot of money spent on it? The church, exactly. So you look back there. I'm looking right there. Do you see that? Kind of that hazy, you know, picture of Venice and so forth. That's St. Mark's, named after one of the writers of the Gospels. St. Mark's, the biggest cathedral, and actually probably one of the highest points in Venice at the time. And one of the cool things about going to Venice today is you can go there, and they don't have a lot of, in the old part, they don't have a lot of, like, modern, high construction skyscrapers and so forth. They don't have that. Okay. And so you could, if you wanted to, you could like hire a gondola person to take you on the canals and transport. How many of you guys, that would be like, that'd be cool. I'd like someday to go on a gondola. Do you want him to sing to you? No. <laughs> if you want him to sing to you, that'll cost extra. <laughs> yeah, I've been in one of those gondolas and you're like, why isn't he singing? It'll cost you extra. So, and actually, hopefully Venice will still be there uh, the next time you guys want to actually go there because it is sinking a bit. It's built on a marsh, and it is sinking a bit. So, you know, hopefully it won't sink. All right, did we get to Rome? How did Rome end up having so much money coming through there? What would you say, Reese? Rome. Now, all of this is, and the trade that comes through, it's like, even if you're not a merchant, if you have merchants making money in your community, that money is going to start spreading out and ending up in various different places. Does that make sense? So if you live in a place where a lot of trade is coming into, it's ultimately going to help. That's not the major source. What are some of the other major sources for, the, uh, for Rome to get money? The Pope lives there. Do you have that in your notes? The Pope. And who's the Pope? What is, the, what is the position of the Pope? What is he? What does the Pope do? Bella, Bella, what does the Pope do? He's the leader of the Roman Catholic Church. You guys knew that? Okay, who chooses the Pope? Did anybody know? Did you guys, did you guys cover that last year? How is a Pope chosen? 
Is the Pope like inherited as like a king, and, and, and the king dies, and then the son becomes the next king? The Pope dies, and then his son becomes the next Pope? It's not that way? It's not hereditary, yeah. Well, how do you know the, who, who God has chosen? What mechanism is going to be in place to pick a pope? Because, in fact, ultimately, that mechanism in place, you're going to hear people say, that was God's choice, carried out through individual humans who voted for that. First of all, see, let's see what you know about this. Why does it sound weird that Mr. Hansen would say something about, like, the pope has a son? Let's see what you know about the pope and the Catholic Church and other uh, things. Do popes, are popes supposed to have sons? No, put that down. What does that mean when you don't get married? I suppose you could say you don't get married. Okay. Um, what is it? Let's see, here's a fancy word. What is the word that means you don't have any of that marital relationship sort of thing that leads to offspring? Do you know what that word is? Hmm, nobody knows that word? It sounds like celebrate, but it's definitely not celebrate. Yes? Celibate, very good. Celibate or celibacy, okay? Popes and every official position in the church, all the men from pope right down to the village priest and the local monks, no marriage, and they're not supposed to have intimate relations with anyone. And you know what I mean by intimate relations? I mean intimate relations of the intimacy sort of thing and so forth. What are you talking about? Okay, no kids. And yet, we'll see later on as we go through this unit, that's going to be one of the criticisms within the, uh, the church itself is that sometimes popes have kids. They don't have wives officially, but they have mistresses, and some of the mistresses have kids. And you're like, that sounds like an issue. We'll hold off onto that later. Okay, so you've got the pope. So still, how is the pope chosen? What do you suppose? Are they going to put it to a vote and everybody in the Catholic Church gets to vote on the pope? Do you have any idea? Raise your hand if you know, is like, what is one of the top titles of a person in the Catholic Church, but just below a pope? I'll give you some candidates. Raise your hand if you think this is one of the top titles just below a pope. Ready? Priest. You think a priest? You're like, maybe. I don't know. If I told you local village priest, that puts it at a pretty low level within the hierarchy of the Catholic Church. How about a monk? Nobody goes for a hand on that? Very good. That's also going to be a low-ranking uh, person within the Catholic Church. What about a nun, a female one, who, a female who, is, who has sworn off marriage and is celibate and lives with other nuns in a convent? Do they get a vote for Pope? How about bishop? Sounds a little bit more likely. They're getting up there. Bishops are going to be leaders of local communities and so forth. How about archbishop? That's a little bit higher. You hear an archbishop? How about cardinal? Write that down. Cardinal, which you just like, cardinal, cardinal. How do I remember cardinal? Oh, guess what color cardinals wear? What are cardinals the bird? What are the color are they? They're red, yeah. Cardinals wear red, and they're like very high-ranking people in the Catholic Church, and they choose the pope. So that's how a pope is chosen, okay? They, they were there chosen. Are you guys ready to hear a really stupid old uh, uh, old, like dad joke? Ready? Okay. It actually will help you remember. Most, you can write this down, most popes in history have been from Italy. But in the 1970s, there was a gathering of cardinals. The, the previous pope had just died. The cardinals got together in Rome, and they prayed, and they talked, and they took, uh, and, and they voted for a new pope. Right? And the joke was, how did the cardinals in Rome pick a pope? How did they pick John Paul II, the man who would become the, the, the next pope? Ready? They took a poll. Oh, you've got to laugh here. Which means you actually have some understanding of the, the nature of that joke. They took a poll. I mean, like when we pick the president of the United States, do we do a poll? Do we vote? Yes. But what is another meaning of the word take a poll, as in, like, instead of just, like, take a vote? Are there people who would say, I am a poll? Do any of you know anybody that is, like, your ancestry that is or was a poll? 
Raise your hand if you have an idea of where poles live currently in the world. Thank you very much. The man who became the Pope was from Poland. But I'm bummed. He was a Pole. It was like the first non-Italian Pope chosen for a long time. He took a oh gosh, it's a lame joke anyway. So, okay, whatever. So the Cardinals choose the Pope. So, getting back to it. How does Rome have so much money? How does Rome have so much money? Just because the Pope is there. Bella, why does Rome have so much money? Okay. What do we call that? It's like a, it's taxes. When the government collects taxes, what is collected from people within a religious organization? It's not a tax. It's like a tax. Tithes. Okay, and I think I wrote that word down too. Did I write that word down? Nope. I'm going to write it on the board for you. Ready? Tithes. T I T H E S or tithing. Tithes. It's like an offering of money from the people, from the Catholics, to the church. Some of it stays in the local community, in the local church. Some of it goes to Rome. And a fair amount of it goes to Rome. Because how much of Europe at that time was Catholic? Like pretty much most of Western Europe. Further east you go, then you bump into like East Orthodox, which is a different type of Christianity. So make sure you have that down. A lot of money coming to the Pope through tithes. That's a big one. Another thing is that the Pope actually directly controls this land. A big chunk of central Italy is known as the Papal States, P-A-P-A-L, not PayPal. That's a different thing. That's like a credit card. Papal. So he actually, it's kind of weird. He's the Pope for all the Catholics all over the place, France and Spain and Portugal and Germany and England. But for this area, the Pope is actually also like the king. That's his territory. Now, it's weird because, like, sometimes you will have this territory, the Papal States, go to war with other territories in Italy. So if you're the king, what do you do when you go to war with some other area? Are you going to get on your horse and go to war? Yes, no, maybe. I don't know. If you want to make sure the job's done right, what do you do? You stay. I'll take care of it. Give me full authority over your army. I'll take care of it. Do you trust me? Maybe you do. But a lot of those kings back in those days, they would out go, go out there and lead their forces. Right? Do you expect a pope to get, a, get like on armor and like get out there and lead their force? You're like, no. Most of the time they didn't. But there was one pope that was like, I can't trust anybody to do the job that needs to be done with my army. And he was called the warrior pope. And he literally would put a suit of armor on, put, get on a horse, and go out and do battle. Which was really weird, because if you're like on the other side, on the other side, they're pretty much all Catholic too, and they see the Pope coming at you with a sword, what are you going to do? <laughs> what do you do? You're like, surrender, you're like, Pope, no! I gotta, like you're the head of my church, but you're on the other side because we got this war between two territories. This is weird. I mean, like, today, is there still a pope? Yes. Okay, does the pope have lots and lots of land like back in those days? No. I mean, what is the territory that the pope has? Is the pope still in Rome? Yeah, does the pope have control over all of Rome, the city of Rome? No, it's just a little teeny tiny itsy bitsy part. Oh, here we go, here's the flag. It's called the Vatican City. And it's not huge. I mean, it's not all of Rome. It's a small part of Rome. That's modern. And no, the Pope is not today is not going to get out there and lead an army. Okay? A lot of things happen in the history of the Catholic Church, and we'll be going through some of those, some of the big events that take place during this time period. Okay? But the first thing we have to understand, the Catholic Church is very important. The Pope is very important. A lot of money comes into Rome because that's where the Pope is hanging out. Okay? So is the Pope going to spend money on a church? Let me ask you this one. If you're the Pope, how's your church going to look compared to the church, say, I don't know, in Florence or in Venice or anywhere else? 
Your, oh, I love that. You can write that down. Here you go. We've got the Pope. It says, my church is going to look better. It's going to look better. I'm the Pope. I'm the head of the, uh, I'm in Rome. My church has got to look better. Interesting question to be answered later on. Could that cause any problems? Because if your church is going to look better, is that going to cost a lot of money? Where are you going to get that money? <laughs> tithing. What if there's not enough money coming in tithings? We'll look at that because this is going to create, let's just put it, it's like, I mean, what's the worst thing that could possibly happen? You come up with some fundraising method so that you can have the biggest, boldest, baddest church building in all of the Catholic area. I mean, like, what's the worst thing that could possibly happen? Like the church breaks apart in the Protestant Reformation? Oh, is that going to happen? Yeah, we've got some more story to tell you later on. We're not going to develop that fully right now. Just know this. The Pope is very important, very powerful. He's got a lot of money at his disposal, and a lot of it's coming through Rome. Got it? What about Florence? Write that down. That's the third city. What about Florence? Florence has a lot of money coming through it. And it's, there's the Italian way of spelling it, Farenza, and we've got that picture up there. You can tell a lot of money was spent in Florence back in those days. Where'd they get it? Where'd they get it? Any idea? This one's a little different. They're not so much of a merchant city, and the Pope doesn't live there. But think about this. I'll bet you guys have figured this out. I'll throw a couple clues. As soon as you've got enough of an understanding, you raise your hand and you tell me. All right, I'll give you a clue. I'm the Pope. Do I have a lot of money? Yes, I got a lot of money. Where am I going to put the money? I'm just going to put it in a little sack and like keep an eye on it right where I am? Yeah? You're going to put some money in the military for security and so forth. But I, I want to have my money in a safe place where I can get it when I need it. And maybe a safe place that maybe the people who are looking after it, they can kind of invest a little bit. Maybe then it can grow. Yes? Now, if I give it to a trader, they'll look and go, well, I got some money. They're going to go buy something, and then they'll trade and so forth. I'm like, okay, well, that's fine and so forth. But I want to know I can put it in a place that's going to be safe, and I can go get that when I need it. Yes? Banking? What do you think? A bank? Does that sound like a safe place? Where's my bank? Very good. Write it down. The banks... The Pope's banks are in Florence. For much of this time period, banks in Florence got the customer of the Pope and other people. And there's other ways they made money. They, they did woolens and so forth. They were selling different things. But as it turns out, Florence, no denying, they made a lot of money and some of it was through banking and one of the biggest customers was the Pope. Got that? Does that make sense? I mean, think of it today. A city in the United States of America that has a lot of banks in it, banking headquarters, and has a lot of money coming through it, and really big, tall buildings as part of that structure. And a lot of trade coming through it as well. What is one of the wealthiest cities in this country with high population? New York City. Yeah, I mean, the World Trade Center located in New York City. Okay. All right. So here we go. We've got three very wealthy cities and others are making money with the trade coming in and shuffling in this, that, and so forth. And we're going to see where a bunch of that money is going to be spent in the arts. Before we get too far along on that, there's Venice, very wealthy. There's the Pope in Rome with the Papal States. And then, of course, there's Florence, which I've got up on that. It's almost like the exact same vantage point. There's a hill, literally, right outside of Florence. It's great for taking pictures from in my group, when I traveled there and so forth, we had a picture with this in the background. I was like, yay. Well, what, do, what, what, what last time we sort of talked about how, all right, so we've got all this money coming in, and there's all these like new ideas, but renewal of ideas. Renaissance means rebirth. So we're going to see old ideas making their way back up into popularity. And these old ideas came from where? Ancient times in where? Do you remember? You have it written down? Greece and Rome. Two of the great civilizations and so forth in the past. Greek ideas, Roman ideas, and so forth. 
We'll see all of that kind of coming back into it. Because that was like, those were the great old days. Although, the time period they were coming from was the Middle Ages. And don't forget this. During the Middle Ages, sometimes the people in the Renaissance would go, oh, those were the Dark Ages. They weren't that great. Now is the really good time. But it's not like all of a sudden it's like, bam, you have this and then you have that. The Middle Ages, there was something that was very important during the Middle Ages that kept people together. I mean, think of this. Write this down. Middle Ages, right before the Renaissance. You had a lot of fighting. You had countries fighting each other. If you go to the early Middle Ages, you had like Germanic tribes attacking. And it's like crazy. Like, wow. Is there anything, anything, this is important. Is there anything that could provide some stability, some hope, some security? In the midst of all the crazy things, you can still count on what institution provided hope for like a better life. Now, art is nice and so forth for some people and so forth. We're going to see that art's going to be very cool and so forth. But if you go through like hundreds of hundreds of years, what could people like turn to, even in the midst of chaos and so forth, and go, well, at least we've got this. Somebody's looking out for us. The church, yeah, write that down. And the church, meaning the Roman Catholic Church. So you could look to the church. The church had that hope. Even in the midst of things that are falling apart and so forth, you look to the church. And is the church perfect? No, we'll see. There's going to be some issues within the Catholic Church, and sometimes it'll look great, and sometimes it'll like you've got a lot of people criticizing it. But the church is very important. And as we go into the Renaissance, the church is still important. I want you to understand that. So when we get to art and so forth, guess what's going to be the subject matter of a lot of art during the Renaissance? Church. Okay? Guess what a lot of money is going to go into as far as buildings? Churches. Okay? So the church is still very, very important. Remember that. Okay? During that time period, that transition. And notice... I mean, is the, pope, is, or is the Pope all of a sudden going, wow, nobody's like tithing to me anymore. I'm not getting this money coming through. Is that, did I say that? No, there's a lot of money coming through. And perhaps for some, even more. But there's some interesting things going on. This is going to be the beginning of a long transition, write this down, in which the church is going to lose a bit of its top dog status among people in Europe. I'll try and say it another way. Other things are going to start moving into and becoming very important in the lives of the people living in Europe. But it's going to be a slow process. By the time we get to the end of this unit, we'll see other things popping up in which people say, well, I'm not sure if the church has all the answers on this particular arena. Maybe other places have answers in this particular area. Like, like what? Do you know where I'm going on this? If you were to read, say, back in those days, where are humans located? On Earth. Hello. What is up in the sky? The sun, the moon, the stars. What is the relationship of the earth, where we live, to the sun and the moon and the stars? Right now? Yes. The what? Oh, yeah, they're going to become interested in astronomy. So what do you, what, what, well, I answer the question. What is the relationship, according to the church back in those days, what is the relationship of the earth and the sun? Do they move around each other? And if so, who moves, what, what moves around what? Is that what they said, the sun moves around the earth? Well, of course, of course the sun moves around the earth. Write that down. That was the position of the church. Of course the sun moves around the earth. Because God placed humans on the earth, and they're the most important thing, image of God, so everything goes around the humans on the earth. Correct? Actually, we'll get into it later on. There will be plenty of people going, uh, yeah, that's not in the Bible. And if somebody like, figured that out, then they're like misreading the Bible. Da, 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 da. It's not that way. Anybody know? So what is it? Does the earth go around the sun? Or, excuse me, does the sun go around the earth? 
Does, 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 does the earth grow around the sun? <sighs> Heretic. Let's burn them at the stake. I mean, that's what they would do maybe back in those days. Because like, what? That doesn't fit with the way we understand humans and the earth and the position of the universe. So make a little note of this. As we go forward in time, science is going to start popping up and becoming more important to answering some very important questions. Is it going to be able to answer every single question? Does science help dictate whether we're alive or dead? And you're like, well, if scientifically you catch a deadly disease, hmm, that might scientifically explain why you're not here anymore. But how about this one? <laughs> what is the meaning of your life? Whoa, deep. What is the meaning of your life? Does science answer that? Or are there other sources of response to questions like that? History is fascinating. Because as we go through history, we're going to be seeing all kinds of different things popping up. Write this down. It's during the Renaissance that people start asking questions like, what are humans for? Why are we here? And how do we fit in? It's not like they hadn't answered it before. But it's interesting. You put enough money in the pockets of enough people, and they start walking around. I don't know. How many of you guys would feel good if all of a sudden whoo, your ship came in? Literally, you're in Venice. Your ship comes in, and you're like, yes, it didn't sink. Oh, yeah. Cha-ching. I got money. How many of you guys would feel pretty good if all of a sudden you had a fair amount of money at your disposal? Would you feel pretty good? Would you feel like thinking about what you could spend it on? Like, I think I'm going to have a bigger building than so-and-so. I'm going to buy some of that art and so forth. It like gives you this sort of sunny optimism. Yeah. Although sometimes you're like, oh, I don't know. I need to keep it safe and da, da, da. But in any event, you can put this down. In Italy, a fair number of people, particularly the wealthy, have money, and they're putting it into art, and they're putting, they're just thinking about things different. They're thinking about things different. They're like, they're like, what am I? Why am I here? Why am I so special? And they start reading things a little bit differently. They start looking, I don't want to say completely outside the church for answers, but they start creating some interesting conclusions. Are you ready? It's called humanism. Write it down. Humanism. This is a concept that comes out of the Renaissance. Humanism. Obviously, it has something to do with humans. This is an idea that starts picking up during the time of the Renaissance. And the idea basically boils down to this. Okay? In the Renaissance, people, many of the mostly wealthy, the poor people are like poor, 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 and they have it pretty rough. But among those that are doing pretty well, they're sort of looking around going, I'm feeling pretty good. And you know what? I'm a human. Write this down. And humans are special. Mm-hmm. Humans are special. Don't tell me humans aren't special. Because humans are special. And you can quote the Bible. Humans are created in the image of God. They've got like God's spark in them. So that makes them pretty special. And they're like, so they start to identify, well, what about that human thing makes them so special? It's up there. The ability to reason. Oh. The ability to think. Oh. Humans were given the ability to think. They've got brains. They can look at things and reach all kinds of interesting conclusions. They don't just have to be told what to do and think. They have a brain themselves, which if they employ their brain and watch and observe and so forth, they can come up with all kinds of amazing things. Interesting. Now, does anyone see in a potential danger if you get a whole bunch of people thinking for themselves compared to taking direction from a very long established authority like the church. They could try to change things and move things away from traditional sources of knowledge like the church. That's going to be an issue moving forward. If you were to, if you were to hear somebody talk about humanism today, they might say something like secular humanism. Oh, that's a fancy word. Secular. Anybody know what secular means? 
I'll give you a clue. Secular. S-E-C-U-L-A-R. Secular. It means non-religious. Secular humanism. Secular humanism, it's a modern concept, and it basically is like the idea that humans are special, they have the ability to reason and so forth. It sounds kind of like humanism. Is there going to be a religious connection? No. It means like, how do humans get to be so special under secular human as if they weren't given it by God as a created being? Like, what are we talking about? What is an alternative theory as to how humans came into existence separate from the Christian or religious theory that humans were created by God? Do you know? Yeah. Product of evolution. How many of you guys have heard of like the theory of evolution? Right? That humans are the latest in a long series of evolu evolutionary changes and so forth and have close uh, relationship to other primates occupying on the planet. Is that going to be a big deal when that co issue comes along? Yeah, that's going to pop along in the 1800s, and that's going to be a big one, and that's going to be a controversy and so forth. So that's where you look and you're like, nothing to do with religion and so forth, secular humanism, but this still ties in. Notice, who gives humans that special ability? God. So they're going to go, okay, God. Well, what happens if some of the humans come up with ideas that don't necessarily fit with what the Pope says? Could that create some problems? What if you're the Pope, and this guy's using his own head, and he reaches conclusions that are different from you? Are you going to be okay with that? Uh-uh. He's going to go, right here, read the passage. Right here. Oh, and by the way, I'm the Pope. <laughs> I'm not going to be happy if you start going off in some other direction. That's not going to work for me. All right? So, one of the things that happens within humanism is there's a lot of focus, and it actually goes back to the ancient times, idealism. It's this idea of there are ideal things. There's ideal um, lives. There's ideal people. There is ideal, I mean, it's like Plato from ancient times in ancient Greece. There is all these wonderful, amazing ideals, and it is for us, the humans, to identify what the ideals are and steep ourselves in it. Ideal is wonderful. The perfect chair, the perfect haircut, the perfect everything, although we'll get to the perfect date in just a minute. Um, you're going to have some people coming along later and going, no, 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 no. It's not, we don't want the perfect this, that, and so forth. We'll see it in art. Because some of the artists are going to paint the perfect body, the perfect muscular, healthy. Which, by the way, do you think is going to be young or old? You think it's going to be young? What's, what's the matter with old people? Mm -hmm. Wrinkly? Oh, hair falling out? Forget all this and so forth? I don't know. What do you think of when you think of like, the perfect grandparent is because of like how their face is, or because of something that's deeper inside. What is it? If you think of a grandparent positively, is it because of what's inside, or is it because of outward appearances? It's an interesting question. Yeah. So there's going to be a little bit of debate going on in the Renaissance during that time period. Um, <laughs> I'm going to show you a clip. Oh my gosh. I'm going to show you a clip. I actually have this loaded up. I'm going to show you a clip. It's from one of my favorite movies. Sandra Bullock is in it. Sandra Bullock, who graduated from high school in my rival high school. She graduated from Washington Lee. I graduated from Yorktown in Arlington, Virginia. She plays an undercover FBI agent in a pageant uh, where somebody is going to be killed or something like that and so forth. Anyway, there's one scene because in the pageant, they ask a series of questions of the people or contestants. And this particular pageant contestant is Miss Rhode Island is asked the question about the perfect date. The perfect date. Perhaps there's something missed in translation in the question. Because when you think of the perfect date, what is today? What is the date? It's September 21st. Is today the perfect date? If someone were to ask you, what is the perfect date? Are they referring to the calendar date? I don't know. Maybe you th thought they were referring to the calendar date. She thought they were referring to the calendar date. You ready to see the clip? Have you guys ever seen this? You've never seen Miss Congeniality? Oh, my gosh. You guys are missing out on life. Miss Congeniality, describe the perfect date. This is the ideal date.
Was he surprised by that answer? What did you suppose he was thinking when he asked that question of the perfect date? What do you suppose he, he was expecting her to answer? I don't know. What is the perfect date? What would be your perfect date? October 31st. I go house to house and I collect Halloween. But it's October 31st, 2019. Not 2020. 2020, they shut down Halloween, for goodness sakes. In 2019, I could go house to house and get candy. Right? I mean, what are they talking about the perfect date? What was he referring to? Like a date you go on, yeah, with somebody. Like, I don't know, walking along the beach and going for, like, dinner and dancing or a movie or something like that. Anyway, the ideal. Idealism, write this down, versus realism, okay? Realism. There's real. Let's see. Da -da -da -da. There we go. Realism. And we've got to back it up a little bit because now we're going to be getting into the art, and the coolest thing about the Renaissance is, yeah, there's all these ideas and things and philosophy and so forth, and they're bringing back Greek and Roman ideas. But probably where it comes out best, and probably where people can look historically and go, all right, I see that there was a change in the way things were in parts of Europe. It's the art. I'm like, what do you mean the art? All right. This is medieval painting, Middle Ages. You got it? That was the kind of art that was produced from like 600, 700, 800, da, 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 all the way to 1200, 1300, and then it started changing. So look at this art first. What can you tell me about this art? First of all, can anyone tell me what is the subject matter of the art? Yep. Jesus. What's Jesus? Right in the middle. Very good. We're going to that down. Religious art. Middle Ages, you had a lot of religious art in Europe. You didn't have a lot of non-religious art. Okay, very good. Good, good. Anybody else there that can be identifiable? Yes? Mary. Mary, Mary who? Jesus' mom. Where's she? Right there. You've got a lot of those things. You go to churches at that time, you've got very similar kinds of art. Mary in the middle, Jesus on her lap. The Virgin Mary, the baby. Okay? Well, what are these other people? Who are they? Are they important? Sure. Are they as important as Mary and Jesus? Maybe not as much. How do we know that they're, like, good? Yes? They're glowing. They've got halos. Write this down. In medieval painting, very, very symbolic. You have halos. Do any of you guys have halos? I can't tell if you've got halos. Do you have halos? Do you have halos? Do we know whether you're good or not? If we were to do a painting of you, should we put a halo on you to determine clearly that we can identify that you're good or bad? Right? In the paintings, they put all kinds of symbols there. Now, something else is going on there. Does it look like it's like raw, raw emotion, a lot of movement? No, it's very stiff. Put this down. And very two-dimensional. Very two-dimensional. That was how they did the paintings. That was how a lot of the art was. Does that look like medieval art? Next time we're going to see this kind of ancient style of art from the ancient Greek times is going to start to influence painters like Michelangelo. And that's not a sculpture. That's a painting that's three-dimensional. A lot of cool stuff coming for you next time in here on the Renaissance. Lots of art. Very good. Okay. Wipe her down, and then you're good to go.